Gokul, welcome back to our YouTube channel. Thank you. This time we want to talk about India. Uh, let me start with the question, what are interesting founders and entrepreneurs in India? See, uh, India is a market where it's a pretty deep and wide market. So uh, uh, we have almost 5,000 listed securities uh, and we have all kinds of sectors uh, listed in the market. So unlike other emerging market that you look at, Brazil, Russia, South Africa, uh, where there's only few kind of sectors that dominate the index, in India, it's a pretty well spread out market. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, great entrepreneurs in the business. And I would say the best kind of entrepreneurs in the country are still in the uh, IT services businesses or pharma businesses or the new age financial services businesses. So within these buckets, you have great entrepreneurs like for example in financial services it will probably Uday, be Uday Kotek in IT services it would be Narayan Murthy, Azim Premji uh, in the, in the uh, pharma businesses it would be Dilip Sangvi uh, so and, and you have a lot of uh, good entrepreneurs even at the mid cap and the small cap level uh, so yeah the, you have uh, uh, some some of them would be from business families or uh, uh, bigger lineage like the tatas and the birlas who have had running businesses for five generations and then you have the first generation entrepreneurs coming up as well so it's a pretty good mix let's do some dive in the it sector in india how do you see the current state of it so within the it space uh, you have the legacy services businesses, mm -hmm. which are these large scaled up Infosys, Wipros of the world who have 200,000 employees and stuff like that. And then you have a lot of a uh, very, very vibrant startup scene funded by VC money and consumer uh, tech businesses and product businesses and SaaS businesses and so on and so forth. So on the IT services side, the growth is slowing, but it's a secular growing industry as long as the uh, as long as uh, software eats into the world and everything gets more and more digital and as uh, internet becomes more and more ubiquitous in terms of distribution and in terms of platform, uh, the demand for technology transformation will always be there and you'd always need smart people to it. And India has, India produces the largest number of computer engineers in the world. and. The, the costing of that, the cost arbitrage, the labor cost arbitrage between the West and India is still very high, probably even bigger now than it was about it was 10 years back adjusted for, from a dollar perspective. So the labor co cost arbitrage is still there. So it's there's still a long runway for growth in these businesses. Uh, from a stock market point of view, you have businesses or stocks in every market cap. So you have the big TCS, uh, which is like a hundred billion dollar market cap, and then you have several good companies in the less than hundred million market cap as well. So it's a wide range. So uh, every investor needs to pick and choose where he wants to play from and what he likes. So even within that, let's say for example, there's Tech Mahindra, which is more focused on telecom uh, vertical, uh, or KPIT, which is more focused on technology services for the automotive sector. Uh, or LNT, which does more for the manufacturing sector. So you have different companies with different uh, uh, industry in industry use and different go to market strategies. So yeah, it's definitely a bottom up stock pickers market. I don't have a top down view. It should be mm -hmm. bottom up view on which stock you're selecting and why you're selecting it and who are running it and what's mm -hmm. the growth potential in that. How is the internet or platform landscape in India compared to Europe or the US? So the internet landscape is pretty buoyant at this point, but a lot of that is in the private market space. So you have a lot of funding happening in the uh, private space. So the only interesting thing about the Indian markets is that uh, India is a space where all the big pools of capital are competing. So. Uh, for example, Japanese SoftBank pumps in a lot of money into Indian startups. Uh, the Chinese guys, both Tencent and Alibaba, 
uh, have their own vehicles on almost every emerging sector food delivery or e-commerce or whatever it is and then you have the us dominant google amazons of the world the fangs of the world active in india as well and then you have domestic uh, entrepreneurs who get capital backing from tiger global kind of hedge fund so it's a very vibrant market where for ev- in every asset class or every sub category you look at there's strong competition uh, happening and it's still in a land grab mode where people are trying to win the market and india is probably one of the last markets that's still available for winning so china is close to most foreign investors and europe that's still dominated by the us companies uh, india is a market where all these firms compete together along with homegrown uh, talent so it's a very vibrant market for example on the cab hailing side uh, it's 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 there's huge competition between ola and uber uh, on the e-commerce side you have amazon flipkart which is now mm-hmm. backed by walmart and then you have snap deals of the world and then paytm now which is also having a berkshire investor uh, or softbank banking uh, softbank has backed it and stuff like that so it's still a space where it's not become like us where there's a strong category leader in every sector it's still in the space where there's a lot of people competing to for that leadership and do you see some winners emerging in this this competition or is it still open it's still open it's still open. you of course have leaders in all of these categories but it's still a open market you still have uh, it's still a evolving space where everyone is trying new things and uh, the leadership stakes can change pretty quickly so it's still a pretty open market let's go a step back and um, you're in Germany for around two years how do you like in comparison to what you experienced here and what you experienced in India how do you see the both economies in comparison so I would probably uh, the economy level talk would be a lot of macro bullshit so I don't mm-hmm. want to get mm-hmm. into that uh, it's pretty easy to know that India is growing at a much faster rate than uh, Germany for example and uh, Germany is still a very export oriented country whereas India mm-hmm. still a lot of it is domestic consumption leave aside those broad things I'll probably sp- speak a little bit more about how value investing differs between Indian markets mm-hmm. and western markets uh, probably i think that's where totally i can uh, add a little bit value uh, so for example value investing in western markets are clearly divided into two broad camps right the mm-hmm. old value the phil fisher kind of a model deep mm-hmm. value guys uh, guys who were really focused on price to earning metrics and price to book metric and so on and so forth and then the new age value guys who can justify google as a value investing bet because there's quality and growth mm-hmm. and compared to that it's cheap and so on and so forth right uh, in india the mean to reversion guys which is the old style quantitative value investing works very poorly compared to the growth at reasonable price kind of a value mm-hmm. investing the reason being i think is that institutionally uh, it's still a market where uh, you have a lot of frauds Uh, you still have a lot of peop- companies which are uninvestable uh, and they are cheap for a reason so if you are just really focusing on cheapness as value investing metric you end up in not just value traps you end up in companies which are outright frauds so as to say so, uh, and secondly you don't have a situation where there is a lot of activist investing happening mm-hmm. or there's a lot of corporate transaction happening so the whole mean reversion kind of a play Uh, is not that attractive in india india is still a very attractive growth at reasonable price market so any garp investors any quality investors who are looking at businesses that can scale over a 10 year period and become large uh, buy and compound kind of stories that for that india is a very very attractive fishing pool uh, because unlike other emerging markets which are pretty, pretty small in size where uh, these economies are pretty small they can they might grow faster but the size of the economy is still pretty smaller in india the point is even at this point it's a 2.5 trillion dollar economy and we are speaking about uh, becoming a 10 trillion economy in the next 15 20 years or something so the size of the opportunity is there and if you are betting on the right person or the right management teams uh, at at a price that is reasonable you don't need a cheap price at prices that are reasonable or fair then the opportunity to compound wealth is humongous so i would think in uh, uh, in in indian value investing 
the uh, the style that focuses more on quality of people uh, uh, makes a big difference so i have this analogy which i keep saying uh, to other people that uh, in in the 300 500 years of credit investing or banking businesses uh, globally if you see ask anyone uh, credit there's three c's that are important right which is uh, counterparty uh, cash flow and collateral so these are the three things that are extremely important and i think these would be the three things which would be the same for equity investing as well in the same order counterparty which is who are you betting on do you think this guy can deliver for you is he a great uh, manager can he uh, take advantage of the opportunities mm-hmm. that is arising and second is cash flow Uh, what kind of business model is he working on what kind of cash flows is he generating and on the last would be collateral lot what's the ideal value for this business or what's the price that you want to pay for this business so i would say it would be the same order and and secondly what i would say is also that the importance of investing with good people or good managers is even more important in emerging markets than in developed markets because in developed markets let's say if you are investing with a bad guy uh and maybe it's extremely cheap and then that gives you optionalities like someone comes in to does some activism takes it over or a new manager comes in and all kinds of uh, potential opportunities in in developing markets mostly these are family owned and so st- it's structurally very difficult to take a existing bad guy out of that company so you're always stuck with the uh, bad guy so as to say and the second thing is by nature emerging markets have much more volatility so there's much more risk so mm-hmm. tomorrow there's some bad decision and two years down the line maybe inflation spikes to 10% or some currency depreciates by 20% all of these things will happen in emerging markets and will continue to happen so when you are investing with a smart guy uh, you are outsourcing a lot of your risk management to him so he takes care of those issues he mm-hmm. takes care of re- regulatory issue happens he manages it for you there's a macroeconomic issue he manages it for you uh, you don't need to worry about risk management that much as investing in a uh, in someone where the risk management is purely at your level so one risk management and second because of this volatility opportunity is also emerge so you want to invest with a guy who you think can capitalize and grow based on those opportunities so in both cases the uh, importance of the management team or the owner operator is far far more important in emerging markets and in markets like india china compared to developed markets so that's also something to make sure that when i'm looking at different markets i i, I think the by nature investing is a, a trade off between quality growth and value right these are the three big factors mm-hmm. between which you make some trade off so you sometimes you say okay is this is that cheap that i'm okay with uh, get lowering my scale on the other two right uh, so it's just that when you come to a market like india uh, the weightage for management quality should be at least two times or three times the weightage that you will have for uh, management quality in western markets or developed markets What are some examples for this good management? When you say when you ask for examples you're asking for names or what kind of people names or companies you have good experience with. Oh see uh, every sector I can say mm-hmm. a leader in a country like India for example a very smart manager in the building product space has been Sara Sanitary where in the finance space has been Bajaj Finance now we are also looking at Piramal Finance who is also a very smart allocator of capital uh, and then in the uh, airline space there is Interglobe Aviation who is a very smart manager that always takes advantage of uh, some issue in the industry he takes advantage of, of it um, and you have smart capital allocators across market caps and across uh, sectors again so it's a pure bottom up uh, analysis and i i think there's also this uh, because uh, in a market like india if you're uh, if you're uh, if you're uh, smart and if you're let's say doing well in a particular region you have the ability to scale up across across the country and that gives you the that gives you a very big uh, uh, market to fend for unlike if you're a great retailer in sri lanka most probably you're just linked to the growth in sri lankan retail whereas in india if you are 
Kishore Biani who had a few good concepts then for him to scale up becomes that much more easier so for you to really have this big home runs if you're betting on the right guy this big five bagger 10 bagger kind of stories uh, India is a very attractive market I think even uh, not just anecdotally even uh, uh, someone who has done research says that uh, India has produced the highest multi baggers uh, and probably US is the only thing which is higher than india so yeah, indian markets do give you this kind of opportunity the only thing is uh, what's the price you pay and what cycle do you come in because unlike uh, developed market for example us has been in a 10 year bull market right whereas in india during this 10 years there's been two cycles or three cycles between so you had this big 2005 to 7 space when it was a bull market and then 2008 9 was a bear market as with global markets but the rally happened only from 2009 again to 2010 november or something after that from 2010 november to 2013 october was a brutal bear market for small and mid caps extremely painful bear market and then 2013 to 2017 was a was one of the best bull markets for small and mid caps in india and then 2018 was disastrous like 40% down at a median level for the small and mid caps so because of this higher volatility uh, you, on the same good business you get very different prices quoted within a two year time frame so your ability to uh, buy into them at the right price is much easier i would say and then to hold on to them and then ride the next wave becomes i think that's the key uh, yeah buy buy uh, bet on the right manager and then buy it at a cycle when it's not good you mentioned you <coughs> sorry <coughs> you mentioned frauds before how do you protect yourself so fortunately or unfortunately it still is a game that can be only done from bottom up research and being on the ground so i would still say if you are a global investor who is sitting outside of the country and then trying to invest in india you should stick with the well known and bigger names uh, there's no point in going into the small and mid cap space i think that's a space that should still be with the local investors uh, people who can go meet the management have feet on the ground and do checks now, one thing on frauds i would say a little different from the global markets i would say is that in uh, developed markets most of the frauds that i've seen are uh, frauds where uh someone is pumping up the profits so he is just instead of showing a 100 dollar profit he is showing a 200 dollar profit through all kind of accounting gimmickry and so on and so forth in india majority of the problems in small mid caps is actually the reverse a company that should earn 100 dollars is actually only reporting 50 dollars because his for historical reasons he has always shown lower profit to reduce the taxes and he takes out money through other leakages so in a lot of cases uh it's a great business it should make a lot of money and it is making a lot of money but it's not getting reflected in the account so those that's a big uh, dichotomy i have seen between the indian frauds or uh, indian companies that do all these accounting gimmicks to the other other developed markets and how do you uh, uh, screen for them I, i think it is pretty much how you do it globally you look at cash flows you look at what's Uh, what kind of accounting policies do they have and then you do some ground checks and then you meet management and see uh, all kinds of primary and secondary research triangulate them uh, and then you come to a conclusion so um, yeah uh, i would still think if you want to go into small and mid caps in india that should still be a specialist indian specialist it should not be someone sitting outside and just reading annual reports that doesn't work what else do you take out of you, you already told me you're doing a lot of research on the ground what else do you take out of it from your impressions from indian companies see uh, indian companies are entrepreneurial i would think that india by nature uh, because it's coming from a, a socialist kind of a mindset where all these entrepreneurs have been forced to operate in very very hard regulations and hard circumstances i think they are battle scarred so for them to uh, work with uncertainty uh, or to work with uh, highly regulated markets or to take risks is pretty much embedded who on earth would go and do business 
when regulations were what it was in the india in 80s or 70s of that sort uh, only people who really had a high risk appetite and who really were entrepreneurial right so that entrepreneurial streak is still there in the country so you have a solid set of entrepreneurs and now with the market opening up and regulations dwindling down uh, you have uh, if a smart entrepreneur is capitalizing on these and you have seen how be, uh, by betting on good people there's been very very strong returns across across indian small cap or mid cap or large cap so uh, if you look at the banking for example if you take the best bank or the best housing finance company almost all of them would have compounded at 20 25% or elongated periods of time i'm saying about 20 years 25 years of 20% compounding uh, even on dollar terms i'm saying 15% to 20% kind of compounding so there's been immense wealth creation that's happened uh, i i think when you have an economy that would go from whatever 2 and a half trillion to 10 trillion over the next two decades or something there would be value created so the question is not whether value would be created or not i think the question should be who are the right guys to bet for to take advantage of this opportunity i think that becomes the key in this investing in your field like the small mid cap um, field how much coverage do companies usually have there and who is doing research on them so usually it is uh, it's a pretty uh, inefficient space right that's reason i fish in that so uh, when i was with the older uh, firm uh, the the research boutique uh, in most of the companies where we would have put research reports we would have been the first company to put research reports on them mm-hmm. so uh, the coverage on a lot of these companies are lower now of course Uh, in the last three years of bull market uh, coverage has increased in a lot of these names so mm-hmm. in the 2000 uh, up to 2013 when the small and mid cap and the bear market uh, there was much l- less coverage after that the coverages have significantly increased and how is the shareholder structure in this this field so typically the shareholder structure in most indian companies i am including the large caps mm-hmm. as well as extremely owner operator driven so it will be 50% to 60% with the promoter families uh, and then among the remaining 40% of the float maybe 20% to 25% would be 20% would be retail 10% would be foreign institutions and 10 would be domestic institutions or maybe 30 within between these institutions and 10 retail so that's the rough split usually so uh, of course in sectors like banking and finance the foreign institutions have a much bigger proportion but this would be the usual uh, split that uh, the families or owner or promoter shareholding in most companies in india is far far higher than what you see in western markets what would you recommend to read to understand india better india is a pretty complex market mm-hmm. so i wouldn't think that there's one book or something that you can read i would still think that it takes meaningful amount of time to spend in the country and understand the country's ethos and the companies and the people uh, it's the reason i say this is unlike other small emerging like for example i look at other smaller emerging market there are a lot of emerging markets that are much more simpler to learn and you can sp- spend uh, a few amounts of dedicated time and you can get a little bit of handle of what's happening in india the problem is it's 25 different states on all these states are extremely different in terms of culture language religion uh, everything in terms of where they are in the economic curve uh, what uh, party is ruling it so it's uh, technically it's like saying how do i understand europe so it's mm-hmm. very difficult right you need to understand germany sp- differently france spain differently so in india when you're looking at india as a whole as a market it's a single market but when you go in you will see that it's 20 30 different markets so uh, there's no easy way for it for anyone to understand it but yes of course if you spend meaningful amount of time because it's a english speaking market at the business level and because all the annual reports are in english the transcripts are in english and one good thing which i will see in all the indian companies is that most indian companies do 
conference calls unlike mm-hmm. what i've seen here like the percentage of conference calls in india is actually higher than in europe that i've seen uh, so all these would be in english so if someone really spends time on reading them uh, he can understand it because the accounting systems are more or less aligned to ifrs so you have ifrs accounting and english mm-hmm. speaking business with if you want to read media and newspapers all business uh, newspapers and everything is in english so if you it's just a time you if you sp- you just need to spend much more time to understand india than any other emerging market maybe i i think that would be the same in other bigger emerging markets as well maybe but yeah thank you very much for this part of our interview in the next part we will also talk about the value investing scene in india thank you, thank you.